from Microbe TV. This is a special immune booster recorded during the American Association of Immunologists Conference in Chicago, May 2024, starring Cindy Leifer and Steph Langle and featuring Jane Buckner from the Ben Arroyo Research Institute. So today joining us is Jane Buckner. It's a real pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, we would love to hear about really your life journey in a short 20 minutes. <laughs> Can you tell us about when did you first get excited about science? What was the first memory of that for you? Yeah, you know, I really always was excited about science growing up. I think um, I was one of those people who loved, this is really sets me back, but Reader's Digest had a little medical thing um, every month and I would always read those. So I found that interesting. But when I was young, I was a conflicted person because I also was a musician. And so I had to make a choice between pursuing a musical career or, um, you know, science or something else. Uh, my mother wisely said, you can always do music as a non-professional, but you can't do science if that way. And in fact, today I still play um, not as well as I did 30 years ago. And what do you play? I play clarinet oh. and uh, play in an orchestra. So that's kind of a nice uh, way to blow off steam and think differently. I think that's really helpful for scientists to kind of use their brain in different ways. So I really enjoyed that, but I will say in college, I was a chemistry major and I thought biology was really a kind of soft science. <laughs> I'm just going to admit that. So, but then, you know, as I took chemistry, I started not understanding how that was going to apply to the world that I lived in. And so I became very interested. Once I realized going to medical school, I could become um, a physician scientist. That really excited me. And so that's what actually led me to go to medical school. Um, and I really enjoyed medicine, but I also met these patients who had autoimmune diseases and we didn't understand what was going on with them. So that seemed like the perfect marriage for me of caring for patients and using what I learned from them to ask the questions about, so why did they get an autoimmune disease? How could we treat these better? And that was really my motivation coming out of medical school to pursue immunology and research. Um, and I haven't looked back. <laughs> so did you do any research before you graduated from medical school? Did you did you uh, yeah. explore that while you were an undergrad or? So, you know, as an undergrad, as a chemistry major, I did summer research projects in chemistry. Mm -hmm. They were fine, but didn't light my fire. Um, but I just really thought I would do, want to do that. So in medical school, I just had really limited research because I was really all in, in medicine. And in fact, when I went for my residency, I went into internal medicine. I had a three month uh, stint looking in cancer in, uh, in cancer in research enough for me to say, yeah, this seems cool. Um, but when I started my fellowship in rheumatology, I just went in and said, this is what I want to do. I literally had to learn immunology when I was a fellow in rheumatology. Um, I luckily started that in the early 90s when immunology was just really beginning to be a science where we had more knowledge than 10 years before even. So I've been able to grow with the field since the early 90s um, and learn with the field. And believe me, I learn something new every day, which is a great thing about what we do in science. Absolutely. Yeah. And can you speak to that time of going to medical school and thinking, I want to be a physician scientist. Now people could do the MD PhDs. And can you speak to, has that changed in terms of, you can absolutely have an MD and still be a scientist, but are there programs that are better supportive of that mechanism? Can yeah. You, speak to that? you know, it is really the MD PhD programs were actually out there as well. When I was uh, looking at medical school and I didn't have a research background, so I didn't really qualify for that. So I was fortunate to just kind of created on my own. Um, but yeah, those programs, I think what's really great, those programs are terrific. Um, and I actually help interview the students at the University of Washington for that program, and they're all amazing. Um, so I think the MD-PhD programs are great, but I think what's really good is that they're now recognizing that if someone wants to become medically trained, it's not just medical school, 
that's a long road. It's actually your residencies. So there are ways now to fast track through residency into a subspecialty so that the people who want to do research can start doing that sooner than, you know, the 10 years of medical training. So I think things are better that way, although it's still, we still need more people to join the team. Uh, and I think, you know, when I first started, I, as a person who only has an MD in immunology research, I was a little bit, I felt kind of bad, well, I only have an MD, <laughs> which I know <laughs> a lot of people so think is bad. Right, right. <laughs> but, you know, because I recognize what people learn in graduate school is important and they had some different skill sets than I had. But as I've been involved, particularly since I do human immunology over the last 20 years, I find my MD really valuable. It really helps me step back and say, why do I care? Does this matter? Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm even have more benefit because I still see patients in rheumatology clinic once a week. And so not only do I meet new patients and learn about their disease. I've actually cared for some patients for 20 years. So I'll know what it looks like to be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when you're a 35 year old woman and what that looks like when you're 55 and getting your knees replaced um, or someone with lupus and, and other diseases. And that has made a huge impression on the questions I ask. So, and also patients ask really good questions, um, really impressively good questions. So I, I feel that I get kind of fed every week and inspired every week by my patients to go back to the lab and do that work as well. So can you talk a little bit about the research that you do in your lab? Absolutely. So, so when I started my lab, I uh, was very committed to studying human diseases because I'm just an MD. <laughs> so when we started doing that and, and I was my mentor, Jerry Nepom was really supportive of that. It was, there are a lot more hurdles, but one of the main thing is if you're going to study people, you actually have to bring samples from people into the lab. So a little over 20 years ago with a colleague, Carla Greenbaum, we just put our heads together and said, we have got to do this systematically. We can't just go into the clinic and draw blood here or there. So we developed a biorepository. Um, it now includes 14,000 people um, with across diseases, but also healthy people because studying healthy people is so important. It's important too, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, those people have volunteered their samples and their personal information. And those samples are in our biorepository so we can go to them and ask questions. So when we started that 20 years ago, we didn't know what questions we were going to have. Yeah. And boy, do we have questions. Yeah, very far. Yeah. So it's, that, it's yeah. been great. So in my lab, we've been very interested in looking at um, characteristics, uh, some of which are driven by genetic risk that lead to autoimmunity. And I'm afraid that I can't really just study one thing. So I'm a rheumatologist <laughs> and um, yes, my goal is to cure RA or to have someone else cure it. That's fine with me too. Yeah, as long as it gets cured. Yeah. As long <laughs> as it gets cured. Um, but along the way, I realized that I could learn a lot from type 1 diabetes and the Benaroya Research Institute has a really a lot of strength there. So I would say two thirds of my lab studies type 1 diabetes. The other third studies rheumatoid arthritis and even though that's 100%, the rest of my lab looks at other diseases like lupus or MS or even the immune reactions to checkpoint inhibitors and in cancer. And we try to understand what they share in common. So that goes from genes to understanding what the T cells are doing. And then over the years, I've had an interest in regulatory T cells. And they were kind of rediscovered at the late 90s, right when I started my lab. And somehow I got roped into it by a colleague. And so for, I would say the last, we've studied what may be wrong with them in type 1 diabetes and other um, autoimmune diseases and made some, I think, important discoveries. But my goal has been, could we make um, a regulatory T cell therapeutically? And, and so we've been involved in multiple processes there. And in the last few years, we've actually worked with my colleague, David Rawlings at Seattle Children's to engineer a regulatory cell that is very specific to the tissue. So to the islet, so we could treat type, type 1 diabetes, 
Uh, we've made them for other diseases as well. We're hoping that the company that spun out from that will actually be able to do clinical trials. And so that would be, for me, a wonderful achievement. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're still waiting. We'll find out if they do work. And, um, but it's great to start from, you know, 1999 when the first thought of doing this came to, came to us to actually doing it. And I will say uh, we hit our head against the wall for about 15 years. And then gene editing became a tool we could use. And that has totally changed things that I never dreamed of doing. We can now do. So it's pretty exciting. That's amazing. Yeah, I was kind of interested in that when you were mentioning that. There's there's a lot of advances in like incredible technologies over the past 10 years even. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about that, uh, you know, and how that's influenced how you do your research? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the advances in the last five to 10 years are just amazing. Um, so, you know, we've always studied uh, peripheral blood cells. Uh, because that's what you can get from patients. Today, we're now studying tissues, um, which we can't get all tissues from patients. We have to still use the peripheral blood. Um, but I think bringing that online, um, I always want to get back to blood because as a doctor, I draw blood and I can use that to, to make diagnoses. Um, but I think this going from looking at one cell at a time um, looking at one pathway at a time, which is what my team has done for years, to now being able to look at individual cells, but millions of them, and dissecting those pathways is so powerful. It, it's uh, You can almost get drunk with excitement when you look at the data. Um, we now can look not only at genetic risk, but we can look at the regulation of DNA, which I think is going to be really central to understanding what's going on. So it's very exciting. But um, for the talk I'm going to be giving today with respect to the Steinman Award, I'm going to talk about how we've approached studying the human immune system. And... Um, I would say these new technologies really open a world of possibilities, but I think the rules are the same. We still have to, we get all this data, we still have to distill it down to, okay, which amongst these matters? Yeah. Can we validate this in people with the disease? And then can we say, if we intervene in this pathway, does it change outcome? Right. Does it impact, when is it important? Is it when that disease is initiated 20 years before you know you have rheumatoid arthritis? Or is it important once you're diagnosed? So there's a series of things we still need to do. Um, but yes, it's exciting. And then our ability to manipulate human primary cells means some of those questions I could never ask and I had to ask the people who study mice to do I can ask in my own lab now. So that's exciting. It doesn't mean that studying models isn't useful, but there's things that we can now do. So that's, it's, it's amazing. And what do you think are like the, the next frontier, the challenges with human immunology, especially yeah. related to the, the areas that you study with autoimmune diseases? Yeah. So, you know, for us in autoimmune diseases, um, there have been these waves of kind of changes. So when I first started seeing patients with autoimmune diseases, we could look for their antibodies and we could treat them with just a few medications like prednisone, <laughs> um, a miracle drug that causes side effects. Yeah. Um, and then we had this whole growth of biologic medications like cytokine inhibitors, like TNF inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors. And that was amazing. Literally, you know, people with rheumatoid arthritis in wheelchairs walking two weeks later. Wow. So that was amazing. And we have been, you know, growing that group of drugs for the last 20 years. So I've been seeing patients during that time. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple things. Those drugs don't work forever. Right. And my patients haven't been cured yet. So there's, I think the next frontier for us is to figure out ways to one, can we really re-educate the immune system so we turn off autoimmunity? And I think we're getting closer to that with these antigen-specific therapies. 
And then the other area I'm really passionate about is that we now have the ability to predict the development of autoimmune diseases. We can predict type 1 diabetes. And there's now an FDA-approved drug to treat people before they require insulin to delay that disease. And that was work done uh, by TrialNet. One of my colleagues, Carla Greenbaum, was very engaged in those clinical trials. Um, That's really exciting. The idea that you could slow down progression or potentially stop that. Because if you prevent a disease, you've cured a disease. Um, We have autoantibodies in rheumatoid arthritis that predict disease. There's other diseases where we can do that. So I think the other push for us is to think about, can we look earlier in disease in that preclinical phase? And can we start intervening there? Because I think if we do that, we can prevent and cure these diseases. So it's kind of my clinical take as well as my, as an immunologist take is, we got to get really smart about what drug initiates disease so we can intervene there. So it seems like a lot of genetics need to be involved in that too, because some, some of that's going to be, you know, identifying genetic markers and then doing testing and then biomarkers, like potentially blood markers. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the antibodies in rheumatoid arthritis. That one's well known, but for some of the other ones, it must be more difficult to figure yeah. out the potential for disease. Yeah. So I think there's the genetics, which we've known is important for a long time. You just walk into a clinic and you see the sister sitting next to the person who you have RA and you have type one. I guess that's obvious they're related, right? Right. There's the genetics, but I think what we've also always known is that there's environmental factors that are triggers. And I think that was an area, I, I joke that when I give a talk, I always have a slide that say, you know, genetic risk and then a lightning bolt hits you and you get disease. And the lightning bolt is the environment. It's like everything. Right. I think we can figure out what the lightning bolt is now. And that's that's, that's a new area. So um, there's a lot of interest in looking at exposures, whether those are exposures are to sunlight, changes in diet and exercise, kind of lifestyle. Is it toxins? Is it um, microbiome? But we're now starting to investigate that. And I think we have enough of a handle on the genetics that now we can do environment. Um, So that's an an area that I think will be growing and and is exciting because that will help us modulate these diseases as well. If we know what drives a disease, if we could protect people from that, that would be be great. So that's part of the answer. Um, And we are finding new autoantibodies all the time that predict disease, other diseases. So I think that's going to be important. And then these genetic risk scores could really help us focus in on the right population. Sure. Can you talk to us about your experience as the president of a major research institute? So there's your clinical hat, there's your lab manager hat, and then there's president of a major research institute hat. And how are those different and the same? Yeah. Um, They're... um, The president part is an interesting one, right? Because they don't teach you that in medical school. (laughs) (laughs) But you do learn how to talk to people, so that's helpful. Um, uh, I think the thing that is really enjoyable about being the president of an institute is that I get to think bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to recruit? Where are the next areas that are important? And then the other thing I love is I get to enjoy other people's success. And I certainly love to see my faculty and the scientists and the students doing well. And that's a real privilege as as the president of a research institute. That's great. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? No, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah. That's a special episode of Immune, an immune booster. If you have questions or comments, please send them to immune at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Microbe TV is a 501c3, so your donations are U.S. federal tax deductible. Our guest today is from the Ben Arroyo Research Institute, Jane Buckner. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University at Cindy Leifer on X. Steph Langle is at Case Western Reserve University at Stephanie Langle on X. Music on Immune Boosters is by Tatami. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. Infectious.